Greetings, podcast listeners. Welcome to the last episode of Stalin's Russia from history, from one student to another. This episode will be outside of the A level curriculum, as we will be looking at the legacy of Joseph Stalin. Let's begin with Stalin's death. On the 1st of March, 1953, Stalin was found partially conscious on his bedroom floor after experiencing a cerebral hemorrhage. He died four days later, with the official announcement taking place the next day. Four days of national mourning was declared, whilst he was given a state funeral on the 9th of March. His embalmed body was first displayed in Moscow's House of Unions for three days, before being laid to rest in Lenin's mausoleum in Red Square on the day of his funeral. Hundreds of thousands attended his funeral, and crowds during the period of mourning were so large that crashes took place, killing hundreds of people. Additionally, there was a surge in anti-Soviet agitation crimes during the month of Stalin's death, as there were a number of instances of celebration. Internationally, the Chinese government instituted an official mourning period, whilst a memorial service was held in London at St. George the Martyr Church in Holborn, remembering him for his role in the Second World War's victory. On the day of his death, the Central Committee met, and Council of Ministers Chairman Georgi Melenkov, Minister of Internal Affairs Lavrenti Beria, and Foreign Minister Bashalev Molotov emerged as the new leading figures. Some sources disagree on whether Khrushchev or Molotov were one of the three key figures of the restored system of collective leadership. These three figures were known as the Troika, but more on Troikas later. The wider group of collective leadership following Stalin's death included Malenkov, Beria, Molotov, Volshilov, Khrushchev, Bolganin, Kaganovich, and Mikoyan of the Politburo. They immediately began implementing reforms, including economic reforms consisting of scaling back mass construction projects in exchange for ramping up housing construction and easing taxation on the peasant population in order to stimulate production, and political reforms, including cooperating with Yugoslavia and reducing tensions with the United States of America by negotiating their opposing involvement in the Korean War. Domestically, the criminal system was reformed, anti-Semitic activities stopped, the country's inmate population was halved, and torture was banned in April 1953 as state security and the gulags were reformed. Before we look into any more changes, as promised, let's look into the Troika. On four occasions throughout the Soviet Union's history, the government was headed by an oligarchy, known as the Troika, who were in charge of implementing new laws and policies. Directly following Stalin's death, Malenkov succeeded Stalin in all of his titles, but within a month, he was forced to resign from most of them. From the 15th of March, a troika made up of Malenkov, Beria, and Molotov, or Khrushchev, this position varies by historian, was formed as a form of collective leadership. However, this troika did not last long at all. When the troika was dissolved, Following Beria's dismissal from leadership and arrest on June 26th, Malenkov and First Secretary Nikita Khrushchev were locked in a power struggle. On the 14th of September 1953, Nikita Khrushchev succeeded the deceased General Secretary Stalin as First Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. He further consolidated his power by forcing the removal of his opponent Malenkov as Premier in 1955 and appointing his ally, Bolganin, in his place before removing Bolganin and assuming the position himself on the 27th of March 1958. Therefore, Khrushchev, who had been a staunch supporter of Stalin, ended up becoming his successor. But, with Stalin now dead, was Khrushchev as steadfastly loyal to Stalin as he had been whilst the former dictator was alive? I think it's quite easy to come up to the conclusion that, no, he was not a loyal Stalinist at all. On the 25th of February 1956, Khrushchev made his secret speech, in which he blasted the cult of personality that Stalin had been so dedicated to creating for himself. During his speech, he raised the testament by Lenin that Stalin had suppressed for so long, which criticized Stalin and warned that he would be likely to abuse his power if appointed general secretary. Khrushchev echoed the words of Lenin, highlighting the Great Purge of the 1930s, which was a clear example of Stalin persecuting potential opposition and innocent communists, torturing them into making false confessions, and executing them for acts of treason. 
He criticized Stalin's purge of the Red Army's leading officers, which weakened the Red Army for the German invasion, his deportation of entire ethnicities, his purge of political leaders in the Leningrad affair, his planning of the anti-Semitic doctor's plot purge, the steps he had taken to sabotage relations with Yugoslavia, and all that he had done to create a glorious cult of personality for himself. Despite his criticisms of Stalin and Stalin's fellow perpetrators in the Presidium, he avoided criticizing the mass terror inflicted upon the general population, as it would likely discredit the entire Soviet government. Additionally, he did not criticize Stalin's purges of Trotsky, Bakharin, and Zinoviev, nor did he object to the nationwide program of collectivization. Although the speech was not officially released until 1989, it sparked a massive campaign of de-Stalinization, headed by Khrushchev and groups of party activists and local party leaders. The time during which Khrushchev was a leader of the USSR was seen as a period of increasing liberalization, during which the censorship was relaxed, thousands of political prisoners were released, and revolts were sparked in Hungary and Poland, due to disillusionment with the Soviet government. This weakening of the Soviet Union's authority ultimately culminated in Khrushchev ousting in 1964, when he was replaced by another Troika, consisting of Leonid Brezhnev as First Secretary, Alexei Kosygin as Premier, and Nikolai Podgorny as Central Committee Secretary, and later as the de jure Head of State. Under this Troika, the industrial and agricultural sectors under the party's management were unified under the control of cadres, which are a group of communist activists specially trained for a particular purpose or profession. Restrictions on the size of household and private plots and livestock numbers were abolished. The central ministries reappeared whilst regional councils disappeared, and the restrictions on term lengths implemented by Khrushchev were abolished. On the 8th of April 1966, Brezhnev became General Secretary, for the first time since Stalin officially held the post in 1934, as he was not re-elected at the 17th Party Congress, but continued to hold the same powers. He remained limited by his fellow members of the Troika until early 1970, when he had risen to a greater authority, and in the mid-1970s when he became the national leader. In 1977, he removed Podgorny from power and gained the title of President. Although he had achieved a few great feats in the 1970s, such as the idea of developed socialism, embracing scientific and technical innovations, and the US recognizing their nuclear parity with the Soviet Union. But reaching this peak, he began to weaken, both in the political and physical sense. The USSR underwent economic stagnation, coupled with increased military spending, and a catastrophic decision to enter the Afghan war in December 1979. By the time of his death on November 10th, 1982, the USSR was no longer as strong of a world power as it had been. The next two leaders displayed the turbulent times for the USSR, with Brezhnev's successor, Yuri Andropov, dying after just 15 months of rule, and his successor, Konstantin Shevchenko, dying after just 13 months of leadership. His successor was Mikhail Gorbachev, the final leader of the Soviet Union, who died recently on the 30th of August in 2022 at the age of 91. Under Mikhail Gorbachev, the USSR underwent a policy of glasnost, as political freedoms increased, with repression of authors reduced, the operations of the secret police limited, the release of political prisoners, the ability for newspapers to criticize the government, and for non-communist parties to join elections. Additionally, the economy underwent a restructuring program, known as perestroika. Private businesses became legal for the first time in almost 70 years, foreign investment was encouraged, and workers' rights improved as they could go on strike. However, these economic and political reforms did little to help the country. In his final speech before his resignation, Gorbachev explained that the old system collapsed before the new one had developed. As a result, food shortages and rationing marred Gorbachev's period of leadership. One area of debate between historians is Gorbachev's role at the end of the Soviet Union. During his time as Soviet leader, Gorbachev put an end to the Cold War, for which he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1990. He did this by reducing investment in the military, in contrast to the extensive capital that the US put into its military. Moreover, he stood by during uprisings and revolutions of the Soviet Union's satellite states, allowing for the fall of the Berlin Wall, and he withdrew from Afghanistan, where the Soviet Union had been involved in a costly war since 1979. All of this contributed to the end of the Cold War, which were hostile relations between the USSR and the USA. Although popular abroad, Gorbachev was not and continues to not be popular among the people of Russia. 
This paved the way for Boris Yeltsin to gain control of the KGB and Congress. On the 25th of December 1991, Gorbachev announced his resignation as Soviet leader, whilst the hammer and sickle were replaced by the white-blue red flag of the Russian Federation. After his time as a Soviet leader and brief period in the official office of president, he launched the Gorbachev Foundation and has been an avid campaigner for Russia's social democratic movement. He has also been a critic of both Boris Yeltsin and Vladimir Putin. Although he did not personally comment on the 2022 invasion of Ukraine, the foundation did call for the ending of hostilities. Meanwhile, in private, Gorbachev has been said to be extremely frustrated with Putin. Gorbachev's interpreter has said that the Russia-Ukraine conflict has been a source of psychological trauma for the former Soviet leader who believed that his life's work had been destroyed by Putin. Well, there we have it. That is the legacy of Joseph Stalin and the gist of what took place in the Soviet Union following his death up until its collapse. I would be interested to know though, how do you compare Stalin and Putin? Do you see any similarities between their rules? Let me know via social media or send a voice message via the description. If you would like to be kept up to date on the upcoming series of my podcast, such as what it will be about and when it will premiere, please follow my Instagram, at history from one student to another, which is linked in the description. Thank you for listening to this episode of History from One Student to Another. This is the end of the episode and my series on Stalin's Russia. Goodbye. <laughs>